The following is an Ice on Mars presentation. I was jolted awake about an hour ago, confused and disoriented. My heart was pounding and my sheets were soaked in sweat. Some slavering, malevolent horror was in the trailer with me, creeping up on me while I slept with poised claws and razor teeth. The absolute certainty of this coated my mouth with the metallic taste of fear, sour and dry and thick. I grabbed the baseball bat that lays beneath my cot and tiptoed around the cramped darkness of my trailer, straining to hear over the keening of the wind outside and the pounding of my own heart. So begins The New Fish, this episode on... Dread Dialectic. Dread Dialectic. And hey everybody, this is Michael T. Bradley. And this is Gixmatix. And we're here to talk about the short story, it, I mean it doesn't really have a title I don't think, but it's a, uh, it's at least vaguely titled New Fish on the No Sleep Forum again. On No Sleep they um, pretend like the things are real, so this is presented as if it is a real account written by someone. Basic plot synopsis, this is the story of a prison inmate, or an ex-prison inmate, who uh, was in prison years ago and heard a story one night in lockdown while in prison from people who were in prison many years before that, telling them a story about a spooky incident. Wait, 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 wait. How many frames do we have then? Because we start with him talking outside of his trailer about his time in prison Mm -hmm. when he was at the blackout and they were telling the story about the, the new fish, I guess, but but it, from the way you said that, that sounds like there's yet another frame. There is yet another frame once we find out in the story within a story about the story of the new fish. <laughs> okay. Or, origin story of the new fish, if you will. At times I was like, wait, 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 who's telling this again? It reminds me of that like cheesy video effect where more squares are added on top you know like something like kind of recedes in the background and it's just the video getting smaller and like frames being added around it garfunkel and oates love that effect so (laughs) whatever well anything they love is okay by me there you go trigger warnings rape rape some more rape and a little rape (laughs) this is gonna be fun to talk about because skix is like dragging his feet already i don't know if you can tell but he's he's unhappy about this story. He's like, oh my god, there were so many rapes in the first three pages that I just had to give up. And I'm reading it and I'm like, okay, I'm halfway through and there's been one off-screen rape. What the hell are we talking about here? So, I, uh, I, I don't know. I don't know if I got a different version or what, but... <laughs> well, just because they, they don't write a whole scene in which it happens, I did not mean to imply that, but their, their regular and prolific references to rape reported as a very normal thing. I I think I want to kind of just dispense with, like, good or bad, because I think uh, this story is honestly pretty, pretty sparse. We have this one item to discuss, and then we'll go into the ugly, in which I'll basically talk about the story, because I can't really say much beyond Spooky Incident without completely ruining it, because I finished the story. So let's, let's, let's talk about this problematic sort of situation of it because so this is written as if it's taking place in a prison right the frame is and the frame within a frame and when people write prison there's always using quotes here you know sissy boys and raping and all these sorts of things there's a character in there who is forced into being the woman the bitch is the term they use right we find out that after that person was released from prison, they, in fact, changed their name and lived as a woman because of that, and so... Yeah, the, I mean, and the way that's told makes it really unclear what was really going on there. It was, it was sort of a, a forced feminization and forced prostitution that got this person, you know, it was sort of the standard, you uh, go to the biggest guy in prison and they'll protect you in exchange for, you know, rape, and just because you sit still for it doesn't mean it's not forced... Uh, with threat of violence. And the weird thing about that storyline is it's presented as... So in the first frame of the story, uh, the female character, the because I don't know any other way to set that Let's character with apart, that, sure. is with this guy, and the guy she's with there is the one who beat her into becoming a woman, essentially. 
And it's like, I know this language is problematic. I just don't know any better way to describe it. So bear with me. And then she works with a different, bigger guy to have him essentially get shivved outside of the frame of the story. But then she goes and really transitions into a woman to live with that guy after prison. And so it's like, wait, it, it's told almost as if it's like a, yeah, revenge sort of story. But then it's like, wait, was that really? Like, I mean, you know, it sounds a little more Stockholm syndrome right? Yeah, it's confusing. And I think it's confusing because the writer doesn't know what he's saying. I, I, it's, it's intended as a one-off to kind of add color to prison life is what I think. He didn't actually think about what he was writing or what these characters were actually going through. He was just like, wow, prison's so bad, you get stabbed and sometimes you have to take it in the butt and turn into a woman. I mean, that's the impression I got. I, I did read, I read up to the uh, the entrance of the Golden Boy or whatever he was called, and I knew when they opened the story with, Oh, this guy was so pretty. You know, I don't go for guys, but even I was like, oh, shit, we're going to have another one. It, it reminded me of, was it Tommy from Density of Souls, where it was like, oh, you're just so pretty like an angel, you know? Uh, yeah. And, and I might have been a little still still sensitive from that story when I when I see this coming. Like, well, oh. it's I'll, I'll get into what happens with the new <laughs> fish in the ugly, but just, just as a spoiler, he doesn't get raped. So I find it difficult because on one hand it's like well okay if we just accept the story as a story that's supposed to be real right then you have this character who is this multi-time con obviously never really did much with his life not the deepest thinker uh, so it kind of makes sense that he's throwing all of this shit out there and not really thinking about it on the other hand it's not real <laughs> Right. On the other hand, it's not real, and you have to... I All the time... Like, I know that I got so annoyed with Oz. Like, I tried to watch Oz, and it felt like they were trying really hard to be deep and say important things all the time. And, and I just... I was like, I don't know, man. It just, like... To me, it just feels so exploitative, I guess. It's a better show if you like looking at naked guys. All right, fair enough. I, I've actually never watched it, but I'm aware of it. So, I don't know, I think just, like, in general, the idea of setting the story in prison, I think the idea was because it's got to be a bunch of hard guys, right? Like, that's kind of uh, what this is about. This is hard guys, and then this supernatural element is thrown in, and they're all, like, shitting their pants because of it. That's my assumption that that's why it was set in a prison. Also, because of some things that you find out in the story, it, it, it makes more sense with the story that it's set in a singular location. But... Still, I feel like it's very problematic if you're going to choose a setting like that, then kind of try to absolve yourself of any sort of authorial intention or whatever with a setting like that. Some of these things are way too big of issues to take on in a cheap little short story like this, perhaps. And if you're going to have your characters say something problematic, because that's what the character would say, you got to spend a little time developing the character enough to know that the character is not speaking for the for the narrative voice for the authorial intent and that there's consequence to that otherwise you come across as supporting what they say or what's going on i don't know I, as a writer i'm a little torn on the subject because i do believe you have to take responsibility for for things that appear to be said in your own voice but i also think you can't right as if your audience are going to be ignorant. Yeah. But also, I have earned not enough goodwill for them to give me the benefit of the doubt. So there's all that. I mean, it's a real problem. Like, like this reminds me of, like, for instance, I think maybe thinking about something set in prison made me think of this. Natural Born Killers, right? Ooh. Like, I think the problem with that is that the audience didn't get that Stone was being satirical. Right. It's kind of satirizing these characters being seen as heroes and people watched it, and a lot of people saw them as heroes. <laughs> and it's like, I think Stone was kind of punking his own audience in a way. But with Stone, he's done enough, and like you can tell that he actually cares about people enough for that to work, you know? Whereas with this, I don't know this person from Adam. I don't have any sort of 
trust necessarily. So right. it's tough to kind of, it's tough to feel comfortable with this story. This will be the episode where we get called Cuck. <laughs> you always say that. Nobody, <laughs> nobody's calling us Cuck. Uh, I'm disappointed. And here's the thing. I'm not trying to dismiss this story out of hand and say that people shouldn't read it. I, I think that it brings up these issues, and I think that's a good thing. I mean, I'm not saying, like, just write problematic shit so that people talk about it, but I think starting these discussions is good. Your mileage may vary on enjoying the story. I know that I myself, I, I really didn't enjoy the story, but that was just more because it's it's kind of a dull, one-shot story. There, there, there was this beginnings of kind of an interesting thing, but I didn't feel like it really went anywhere, and I didn't feel like it opened up a universe enough to other people playing in it, so... I, I think that's going to be typical of this uh, this medium, though, isn't it? One one bit of, uh, ooh, wouldn't it be interesting if, and then we build a story around that, but it's it's a one, essentially a one-shot deal, right? Sure, though both of the things that we've read so far that are from this style of medium are the opposite of that, so I, you know, I guess I've been spoiled since this is the third thing that I've read like this, and it wasn't like the first two in any way, shape, or form. But in, in any case, point being, I think these are good items to hash out, and I think they're good things to talk about when writing a story. Like, you know, if you look at some of my earlier writings, one of my first feedback was from, I think I was 12 at the time, and a writing uh, professor told me, because I was doing like a college for kids thing over the summer, uh, my professor told me, uh, Michael, this is the sort of story that doesn't make me afraid because it was a horror story. It doesn't make me afraid when I, uh, of the events in the story. It makes me afraid of the author. <laughs> <laughs> Granted, I mean, I mean, it wasn't anything special and it wasn't anything... I mean, it was pretty terrible. When you have very little experience and you're just trying to write, you know, it, it can turn out silly. But I, I feel like this is maybe one of those sorts of cases where it's like... Uh, I kind of wish I could hear from the author and see what they were going for, because I feel like maybe what they were going for isn't what came out of it. Well, the author perhaps can uh, contact us. Yeah, yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd love to have that conversation. I'd love to hear some feedback, see what the author thinks about that, if they think that we're just being silly and overthinking it, or if they're like, yeah, I struggled with it, I tried to show my voice through these bits, and maybe we just missed it. You know, I, I, I think that would be fascinating. We, we can do a PS episode down the line if there's enough conversation. Uh, l let's real quickly go through the ugly and I'll tell you what the spooky incident is. Essentially, that new fish gets put into the cell and it's, you know, it's like the pure land of the slaughter setup. Like, he's put in a cell with this huge guy who's like, everybody knows that, like, what he likes to do to new fish is just violate the hell out of them so that they're broken to the point that nobody can ever use them again, and... So rape context, even though he doesn't succeed. Through the night, there are just these horrible sounds, and everybody's like, oh my god. And the next day, of course, the big guy is torn into pieces, and, like, uh, somebody glimpsed him as they dragged the carcass out, and, like, the skin and sinew were gone from his face, and yada, 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 and they get one of those Silence of the Lambs carrying case things for the new fish and put him in it, and blah, 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 and, and then through various means and at least one more framing device, uh, we find out that the new fish was actually this kid from, like, the 1800s who made a pact with Satan and um, for immortality, and they kept, uh, the people of the town kept trying to kill him, and it would always fail, and he would just go and murder people, and yada, yada, yada. They ended up bricking him up in the sewers beneath what then became the jail. And so now he just kind of comes out every now and then and murders the shit out of people, and they blame it on riots or whatever. Hmm. A couple of the things in there I found a little bit fun, and I thought, oh, this could have worked, but it just, it, it wasn't enough to warrant staying interested through the uncomfortableness of it. I don't think Deal with the Devil stories really have any traction anymore, do they? I enjoy them. Oh, okay. I find them fun. There, there was a, it's available on Netflix, I think it's called The Last Shift, something like that, uh, and, and I think that was a story that essentially involved Deal with the Devil, uh, you know, it's all in the background, and kind of find out about it eventually through the, through the story, and I I, I don't know. The, uh, like I, I like the classic stuff. The, the story as you described it, I'm imagining it would actually be more effective if you didn't have the deal with the devil. Just 
Here's this guy who's immortal for some reason. I like the no no reason immortals. I, I, I think they're interesting to write about. And of course, who knows? It could be bullshit that that's not his true backstory, but we don't even get an inkling of that and we kind of have to trust it as is and yada yada yada. That would be interesting as well. Or like maybe, you know, I had a buddy who served a dime up in Shawshank and he told me a similar story and it sounded like the same guy, but it can't be the same guy because he was there at that same time. And Oh, I have a friend in Sausalito and you know, something like that, that like every prison just has this kind of character who will show up and, you know, fuck things up now and then. We should but... write this. <laughs> That's our our prison story. I'll handle the bitch sections and uh, <laughs> it'll be great. Yeah. Like, this is definitely not one that I would recommend. I just didn't feel like it was worth it. Like, it didn't press any of my buttons or annoy me. It just, I just thought it was honestly kind of boring, so. So, sorry about that, folks. I think it sparked a good discussion, so that's something. Mm -hmm. Anyway, uh, next time we'll be talking about the the Graveyard Apartment. Is that what it is? That's it. It's a Japanese novel by a Japanese person whose name is not in my head. So be sure to tune in for that. Uh, Until then, if you have feedback, comments, if you're the author of New Fish for sure, drop us a line, dried.dialectic at gmail.com, or leave comments wherever you find this. If you have something that you've written, be it novel, novella, or uh, possibly a a one single short story out of a collection or just on its own, feel free to send us a submission. We're interested in finding some stuff, especially representational stuff, uh, that we can take a look at. Uh, Until next time, this is Michael T. Bradley. And this is Geeks Maddox. And we are 